As our pocket pistol series continues, we are going to start looking at the pros and cons of individual calibers, how to get the most out of those calibers, and some gun and ammo choices available for those calibers. We are starting with 25 ACP. More than any other cartridge, the 25 is derided as a prime example of an underpowered caliber that's inadequate for self-defense. On the flip side, advocates of small caliber handguns always have some story about a little old lady dropping a 300 pound Thugasaurus on PCP with a single shot from her 25 caliber purse gun. But there are a lot of other factors to consider when we're evaluating a self-defense cartridge besides just terminal ballistics. The main advantage of the 25 ACP is that pistols chambered for this cartridge can be smaller than any other semi-autos. That's the very reason John Browning developed it back in 1905. It was designed to have the same ballistics as a 22 long rifle fired from a short barrel, but without the reliability issues associated with rimfire ammo. Micro-sized 25 caliber semi-autos were popular for most of the 20th century, but that popularity had faded by the 80s and 90s. Today, there are hardly any handguns still in production chambered for 25 ACP, but there's still enough demand for the ammo that every major ammo company makes at least one 25 ACP target load, and there are even premium hollow points available from companies like Spear and Hornady. When we think of a pocket pistol now, most of us imagine something like this 380 Smith & Wesson bodyguard. These guns are incredibly small and lightweight, but a lot of the 25s were even smaller. For example, this Beretta 950 Jetfire, fully loaded with nine rounds of 25 ACP, weighs just 11 and a half ounces. It's noticeably smaller and lighter than the bodyguard, which comes in at 14.2 ounces, fully loaded with seven rounds. Unfortunately, using one of these little guys typically means we are sacrificing more than just ballistic effectiveness. Because most 25 autos are based on older designs, they tend to have the same drawbacks common to most small pistols from that era. The sights are almost non-existent, the placement of the controls is awkward, and it can be tough to get a good firing grip on the gun that doesn't occasionally induce malfunctions. That's the case for this Beretta, but also for the Colt 1908 Vest Pocket, or the Baby Browning, or any of the other common micro-sized 25 autos. Now, you might not ever notice any of these problems if you're just casually plinking at the range, but if you add time pressure to your range practice and you emphasize accuracy, you will inevitably run into some challenges that you're not as likely to have with larger handguns or even with some of the more modern pocket pistols. I'm going to keep using the Beretta and the Bodyguard as examples to illustrate what I'm talking about. We could look at some other models that have features that these two don't, but overall I think they are pretty representative of their respective categories of pocket pistols. But as a quick aside, I do have to point out a unique feature of this Beretta just because I think it's really cool. It can be really difficult to rack the slide on these little pistols, partly because there's not a whole lot of slide to hang on to, but with the Jetfire, you don't ever actually have to do that. Instead, you just push this little lever forward, the barrel pops up, you load your magazine like normal, and then you manually put a round in the chamber, close it up, and you're ready to go. So here I've got a 25 with almost no recoil. It's got a short single action trigger and virtually no sights. And then over here, I've got a 380 with fairly snappy recoil, a long double action trigger, and in this case, a pretty decent set of sights. So which one would be better for getting quick and accurate hits at typical self-defense distances? Well, that's gonna have a whole lot to do with the shooter. And the only way to really know is to do some side-by-side -side testing. I decided to test out these two guns with the failure drill. That's two shots to the body and one to the head. I used the black center of a B8 bullseye target for my body shots, and all my head shots had to be inside a three x five index card. Starting from a low ready position, I ran the drill six times with each gun. The first three runs were at seven yards using a two-handed grip, and the second three were at three yards fired strong hand only. I timed each run and I added a full second to my time for any hits outside the black circle or the index card. Looking at the results at seven yards, I had a clear advantage with the bodyguard. My raw times were slightly faster and I was more accurate. This has everything to do with the sights. Here is the sight picture I had with the Beretta. Even with a little neon orange nail polish added to the front sight blade, it's really hard to find it inside the tiny rear notch in any kind of hurry. 
Compare that to the sight picture on the bodyguard, which is much easier to see and gave me a lot more confidence about where my shots were going. At three yards, the sights offered less of an advantage. This time, I was faster and more accurate with the Beretta. With only one hand on the gun, the low recoil of the 25 and the short single action trigger gave me a speed advantage of almost a half second. But I also found it tempting to go too fast with this gun, and I actually missed two of my three shots on the last run. So what I learned from this little exercise is that for me, based on performance alone, it would probably make more sense to carry the bodyguard. With a little practice, I could improve my ability to manage the recoil and run that double action trigger on the bodyguard, and I believe that would require a lot less effort than learning how to accurately point shoot with the Beretta. Before I shot the test, I also found that with the Beretta, if I gripped it in a way so that I could quickly disengage the safety, my hand was too high on the back strap and I would sometimes get slide bite and that could even prevent the slide from cycling, which would cause a failure to feed. And if my thumb was in the wrong place, like down here, occasionally it would engage the safety inadvertently in the middle of a string of fire. Now, I don't have particularly large hands, but for me, there's just not enough real estate on here for a gun with a manual safety. Of course, everyone's hands are different and every 25 caliber pistol is a little different in terms of grip dimensions and placement of the controls. But these are the kind of issues that people tend to run into when they try to use these really small guns and they are issues worth considering before you try to carry one. At the beginning, I said I did not want to limit the evaluation of this cartridge to its terminal ballistic performance alone, but I did run a couple of quick ballistic gel tests with our heavy clothing barrier just to see how it would compare to the FBI standard. First, I tried the 35 grain spear gold dot. The average penetration depth was just 8.4 inches. Now remember, ideally we want at least 12 inches of penetration in gel. That correlates with good real world performance. Four out of the five rounds did expand a little bit, but that's not really helpful if we don't get decent penetration. This kind of performance is pretty typical for small caliber hollow points. If we use a bullet that expands, we sacrifice penetration. So it's actually better to go with a non-expanding full metal jacket load in a lot of these pocket pistol calibers. When I tested the American Eagle 50 grain full metal jacket, the average depth was 12.3 inches. One of the five bullets stopped there at eight inches. It looks like it intersected with some of the disrupted gel from another bullet's wound channel. So that's kind of a fluke, but otherwise the penetration here was surprisingly good. So in theory, 25 ACP should be able to penetrate adequately in tissue, but I've also heard of a lot of instances where 25 was not effective because it was unable to penetrate through bone. And there's actually some data that seems to support this. A few years ago, Greg Elifritz published his excellent stopping power study based on stats that he collected from almost 1800 real world shootings. Of the people who were shot with a 25 ACP, 35% of them were not incapacitated no matter how many times they were hit. With the ballistically similar 22, that number was 31%. So according to Greg's study, about a third of the people shot with a 25 or a 22 did not immediately change their behavior. Now compare that to the larger calibers, 380, 38 Special, 9 millimeter, 40, and 45. They all had between 13 and 17% failures to incapacitate. So if we ignore all other context and assume for a minute that caliber is the only variable that actually matters, it looks like a 22 or a 25 fails to disable twice as often as calibers of 380 and up. So does that mean that 25 ACP deserves its reputation as one of the worst calibers ever? I don't think so, because in reality, context does matter. Personally, if I was limited to carrying a gun with marginal ballistic potential, I would at least want it to be easier to shoot accurately than the typical 25 semi-auto. But for those situations when you have to have the absolute smallest gun possible with as little recoil as possible, it's hard to beat a 25 ACP.